afternoon, everyone, and, or good morning, I suppose. Um, thank you for joining us for our second session of Coffee with a Curator. And I should note, if you do like today's session and you missed our first, you can watch it for free and it's on our YouTube channel. To introduce myself, uh, for those who don't know, I'm Mallory Horrell and I'm the Curator of Collections and Exhibitions at the William Morris Society. I am managing the tech side of today's presentation, so please do, uh, type directly to me in the chat if you are experiencing any technical issues and I'll do my best to help. My colleague, um, Helen Ellitson, is our research and development curator at the Society, and she's going to be delivering today's presentation and chatting with us about a fascinating object from our collection. Just a quick word of housekeeping before we kick off. Uh, we kindly ask that during the presentation, you switch off your microphone and camera. I'm going to do so in just a moment. It just helps us to um, minimize any residual sound and to maximize our internet bandwidth. And just a reminder, if you don't know how to do so, there are two buttons um, at the bottom left hand corner of your screen. You'll see it's a small microphone that says mute and a small uh, stop video. It's a, a little video icon. Just click those. You'll see a, a red cross through it and that will mean you've switched it off successfully. We will also have some time at the end for some questions. So please do hold on to any any questions you may have. But without further ado, I think we're ready. I'm going to hand over to you, Helen, and I'll switch off uh, my camera. And I'll ask you to do the same. Let's get started. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Mallory. Thanks for that brilliant introduction. Um, so I've switched off my video, so I won't be distracting anything. Wonderful. Great. Um, and um, as Mallory said, it's wonderful to see so many people um, here this morning. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us at the William Morris Society to tell um, our members and um, our supporters more about what the amazing collections that we do have. Um, at Kelmscott House in Hammersmith. And um, I was speaking to Mallory just this morning and it turns out that this particular object, Love Among the Ruins, is one of her favourites as well as mine. So um, I do hope you, uh, you'll enjoy our, our short informal chat this morning about Love Among the Ruins. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so here we have um, our very first, oh, see, this is what happens with you. Let me just... Make sure I'm going to be able to switch on to the next slide. Right, oh, here we go. Great. Right. Okay, so here, here we have um, the object we'll be talking about this morning. This is the Society's Platinum Print by Frederick Hollier of the watercolour Love Among the Ruins by Edward Byrne Jones. The Society actually has several, several platinum prints by the renowned photographer Frederick Hollier of Burne Jones's works, including the Search for the Holy Grail tapestries, the Mirror of Venus, and the Annunciation. Platinum prints are a type of photographic print, um, as you can see, made by a monochrome printing process involving platinum. And these prints are in these very attractive um, oak frames. You can actually see the reverse of Love Among the Ruins here in the original Morrison Company frame. Each print is mounted and in, this, in one of these numbered frames and it's labelled, you might just be able to see, um, we've got a close-up here of the numbering on the, at the top of the frame. Morrison Company, 449 Oxford Street. That's where the firm had their showroom until 1917. It's thought that they possibly hung in the Oxford Street showroom. And we can understand why some products that could be purchased from Morrison Company, such as prints of the Holy Grail tapestries, were hanging in the showroom to advertise the tapestries. But it's less obvious why Burne Jones's paintings, like Love Among the Ruins, were there. Were they perhaps a backdrop to a room set? Um, we haven't been able to find out the answer to this so far, and also the numbers on the back of each frame, we haven't managed to um, research yet what those numbers refer to, perhaps a, a logbook from Morrison Company, so hopefully further research might um, prove uh, to find the answer. Uh, but starting with Frederick Collier himself, who produced this print, 
he was known mostly for photographing artists linked to the Pre-Raphaelites and the arts and crafts movement. And under the patronage of Frederick Layton, he photographed the drawings and paintings of, very, of various artists associated with the Pre-Raphaelites, including Dante Gable Rossetti, Simeon Solomon, and of course, Edward Byrne Jones. And there were, very, there were several photographs that Frederick Hollier took that um, I imagine viewers will be familiar with, including this very famous picture of Byrne Jones on the left with William Morris. I won't go into detail about uh, Morris and Byrne Jones because I think most people will probably know a lot, but just a, just a sentence about Byrne Jones. Um, unlike Morris, he didn't come from a wealthy background or family, but they became lifelong friends uh, after meeting at university at Exeter College in Oxford. Um, Byrne Jones gave up studying for a career in the church, deciding to become an artist. And when Morris founded his company, Byrne Jones became a partner in the firm. Um, he became one of the chief designers for tapestries, stained glass and tiles. And then he later collaborated with his great friend Morris on the amazing Kelmscott Press venture. He designed the majority of the amazing illustrations for the press, the most famous of all being the Kelmscott Chaucer. But concentrating on our print, um, this represents the first version of the painting Love Among the Ruins that Burne Jones created. There were two versions of this picture, as well as a miniature version from an illuminated manuscript. And we'll be looking at all those three versions in this talk this morning. So our print on the left, is our photographic representation of Burne Jones's first painting of Love Among the Ruins, which was a watercolour, uh, worked on from 1870 and finished in 1872. And it was one of the very few pictures exhibited by Burne Jones in the early 1870s. It was first shown at the Dudley Gallery and exhibited widely, including um, at the Exposition Universal in Paris in 1878 and it became one of his most admired and most exhibited pictures. The model for the female figure is said to either be Antonia Caver, of whom Burne Jones wrote, she never spoke, but looked like a creature coming from Olympus. I never drew from anyone who came near her for splendor and solemnity. And here we have a picture um, of the model of who it could be, Antonia. Um, the second suggestion is that the model could be Burne Jones's great love, Maria Zambaco. Maria Zambaco first met Burne Jones when she accompanied her mother, who was a member of the wealthy Greek Ionides family and a patron of Burne Jones to his studio in 1866. She proposed that her daughter pose for a watercolour and with Maria's white skin, her abundant red hair and her startling and beautiful looks, she became an ideal model for Burne Jones's heroines. Maria and her cousins, the artist Maurice Bartali Stillman and Morris's great friend Aglaia Coronio were known collectively as the Three Graces. Maria was also artistically gifted in her own right and an affluent and independent divorced woman. Over the next few years, Maria was a constant presence in Burne Jones's studio and he became infatuated with her, making innumerable portraits of his beautiful muse, such as this chalk on the left and there's another of her by Rossetti on the right. However, their private liaison became public in 1869, when Burne Jones refused to leave his family and move with her to Greece, he was married with two children. Contemporary descriptions write of Maria being heartbroken and attempting to drown herself and possibly Burne Jones as well in Regent's Canal. The police were called to break up the disturbance, whereas other accounts mention an attempt to of an overdose by the canal side. But we do know that Rossetti wrote at the time Poor old Ned, Ned uh, Burne Jones, 
Poor old Ned's affairs have come to a smash together. And he and Topsy, uh, that was Morris's nickname, after the most dreadful to do, started for Rome suddenly, leaving the Greek damsel beating up the quarters of all his friends for him and howling like Cassandra. Although Ben Jones vowed to end the relationship, Maria continued to haunt him. This portrait was another commission from Marie's mother after their breakup. The attributes he used to celebrate her beauty also probably lament the failure of the romance. Here we see a wary figure of Cupid drawing back a curtain and Maria fixing her mournful gaze on us. The manuscript you see at the bottom there is illuminated with a version of Chant d'Amour, one of the paintings that Maria posed for and what first brought the two of them together. So going back to our picture, Burne Jones finished painting Love Among the Ruins at the time when his own love affair, as we see, was indeed in ruins. It was widely acclaimed as one of Burne Jones's masterpieces. George de Maurier considered the painting very stunning, almost the best thing he's done, I think. But then he goes on to say, although the lovers are not quite to the taste of your humble servant, the woman is badly drawn, the length of the thighs being out of all reason, and she has neither hips nor belly, and is as bottomless as the everlasting pit. However, for George Eliot, the painting was beyond all criticism. Having seen Love Among the Ruins at the Dudley Gallery, she wrote to Burne Jones to tell him how much his work inspired her. I want in gratitude to tell you that your work makes life larger and more beautiful to us. It was the first work by the artist to be shown overseas and one of the pictures that established Burne Jones's reputation outside Britain. However, disaster struck and it was badly damaged in Paris, where it had been sent for reproduction by photograph in 1893, when unfortunately it was carelessly washed with egg white by a photographer's assistant who had assumed that the painting was in oil, treating the surface in order to enhance the colour and make it shinier and improve the highlights. This was despite a written warning by Byrne Jones on the back of his canvas, warning that the surface would be damaged by the slightest moisture. Byrne Jones had lost other pictures, one in a fire, another had disappeared, but none that had the emotional connection of love among the ruins. Painting soon after his break with Maria. The composition had partly been a celebration and partly sadness on the ultimately doomed affair. The owner of this canvas was Frederick Craven, a Burne Jones collector from Manchester, who told Burne Jones that he had hidden the ruined canvas from his old father so that he could die without knowing what had happened to it. Craven served a writ on the Google Gallery, claiming £5,000 in damages. And though the painting was insured for £2,500, the insurance company had refused to accept liability on the grounds that the photographer's tampering with the surface of the painting had not been an accident in the usual sense of the term. Gukil's lawyers sent a cautionary letter around the English press, instructing them not to allude to the incident. For fear of libel action, an account of the disaster for the Magazine of Art had to be withdrawn. And Byrne Jones himself issued written warnings to his friends, um, and fellow artists on entrusting their paintings to foreign studios, saying, I was absolutely ignorant of the fact that photographers abroad tamper with the surface of the works committed to them. It led him to attack photographic reproduction in general, saying, these photographic processes, at the best, poor mechanical affairs, have drawn out of the world a skillful and beautiful art. The sadness felt by Vern Jones is evident in his letter to George Yard, his wife, when he wrote to her. It is quite irreparable, but it is life and all in the bargain, although I don't know who made the bargain. And Luke Ioannidis, a relevant of Marie Van Barthe, remembered that when he heard the news, 
the sorrow Burne Jones felt was difficult to bear. It seemed that the painting was beyond repair and Burne Jones wrote, I have seen the ruin, love in the ruins with a vengeance, all gone as if the devil had hated it and had had his way. The painting had meant a great deal for him. He said, it was mine, bury me of me, and I must be sorry for a bit. A friend tried to comfort Burne Jones with, if only it hadn't been that one, if only I could put my arms around you and comfort you. However, the next day, Burne Jones examined the full extent of the damage. The paint had flaked off and Maria's face had almost been entirely wiped away. But he set about measuring up the ruined canvas, ordering another of exactly the same size. A large replica in oil was undertaken immediately using his old notes and studies. The original watercolour, meanwhile, was turned back to front on an easel in Burn Jones's studio, where it remained for several years untouched. Burn Jones was conscious of the fact that the new painting could never be quite the same as the original, saying, here and there, it might be a little more skillful, at the cost, perhaps, of some simplicity that pleased people in the first version. Burne Jones used professional models for the oil painting. The male figure is either Alessandro De Marco um, or Gitano Mayo. Alessandro De Marco was one of Evelyn de Morgan's favourite male models, and you see him in many pre Raphaelite paintings. William Blake Richmond, the artist, described him as so graceful and of such a colour, a kind of gold bronze. He sat for long periods, making him in great demand by other um, artists. This is the only known photograph of him by Julia Margaret Cameron, the Shakespeare's Othello. And you can see how striking his looks are. The other option of the male model is Gaetano Mayo. And here we have an, some um, 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 an amazing um, painting of him by Simeon Solomon. Um, but you can also see him in works by Ford Maddox Brown, Layson as well. And he was actually claimed to have been discovered by Simeon Solomon playing the harp in the streets in London. He also worked as Rossetti's studio assistant. And Burne Jones, they said of Burne Jones that he treated his models as human beings. He had a 50 year friendship with William Blake Richmond, became his principal model and studio assistant. And he had became an artist in his own right as well. And the other professional model, um, who, was the who could have been the female, um, is Bessie Keen. And she is, was an um, extremely beautiful uh, professional model as well whose mother Annie had also posed for Burne Jones many years earlier in the Golden Stairs. Burne Jones praised Bessie, saying that she was an excellent sitter. So she may have been a model for both versions, watercolour and oil for Love Among the Ruins. The artist Graham Robertson noticed she succeeded her mother as chief angel and nymph for Burne Jones. The oil version of Love Among the Ruins was exhibited at the New Gallery in 1894, and it now hangs at Whitted Manor, a National Trust property near Wolverhampton, uh, which I strongly recommend visiting um, when lockdown ends and, it's, and it reopens. It's an amazing, um, amazing collection there. Many pre-Raphaelites and arts and crafts objects there. Um, I'd highly recommend a visit. And here we can see both watercolour and oil um, together. Contemporary critics thought that the old version, although better painted, lacked the spirit of youth of the first and the mystery and magic of the earlier watercolour, which we can see on the right. And I did read that Burne Jones tended to agree with them. Um, he said that that is true and the, that youthful spirit will not come back again. So a few months before he died, Burne Jones brought out the ruined watercolour again, 
partially removing the film of egg white by applying ox gall, and he started to repaint the ruined faces. A friend who watched the artist at work compared the sight as being like the dissection of a corpse. Burne Jones was finally able to restore the original, which had meant so much to him. And when it sold in 2013, it reached the, a record for the highest ever price paid for a pre-Raphaelite painting. And it's now in a private collection. So just looking at the story behind it, it's based on a poem of the same title by Robert Browning, written in Italy and published in 1855. In the poem, Browning muses on the decay of a once great city, now completely overgrown and obliterated, perhaps by a sudden disaster such as war or the slow process of decay we don't actually find out. The implication though, is that the love of the two figures is threatened by the same sense of decay that permeates their surroundings. It was said by a critic of the time to elevate the pure and everlasting nature of love above material wealth and glory. We can see cherubs on the entablature of the portal on the left there. And in the right foreground, we have some uh, blue harebells and they connote youth, true love and regeneration all on one hand, while the rose briars suggest the, that nature triumphs over ruins. Browning concludes that the power of love is all that survives. And the last line of his poem is, love is best. Burne Jones has reinterpreted the poem by depicting this romantic but pensive couple in this, what seems to be the ruins of a classical city. In the foreground, we have pieces of broken columns overgrown by briar roses, very similar to those in Burne Jones's Briar Rose series, which he'd begun to work on in 1871 at the same time as our painting. And in his attempt to make the briar wood as threatening as possible, Burne Jones had prickly thorns sent to his studio on the instruction that they be thick as a wrist with long, horrible spikes on it so that he could paint the briars accurately. And you can see they are very similar to um, the briar, briars in our painting here. The doorway on the left is strongly Italian, as is much of Burne Jones's architecture. The man has put aside his instrument, which could be um, some sort of harp, and you can see hanging from his waistband um, is a, like a pen or a stylus. Um, and these suggest human creativity in the form of music, literature or design. And he's put them aside to tenderly embrace his companion, who gazes apprehensively out of the picture, suspended between what was said to be a lost past and an unknown future. The mood is sad and wistful, and combined with a title, do, as we've said, suggest a reference to his affair with Maria Zambarco, which was by this time, as we know, coming to an end. George Eliot thought that the work had a strain of special sadness about it. A miniature version of Love Among the Ruins appears in William Morris and Burne Jones's collaboration in the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. This is an illuminated manuscript of 20 pages bound in red leather and tooled in gold. The text and illustrations by Morris, with six pages featuring illustrations by Burne Jones in watercolour and body colour with, within borders of gold. Calligraphy was one of Morris's many passions, and between 1870 and 1875, he began no fewer than 21 manuscript books, many of which he also illuminated or planned to have decorated by Fern Jones. There are four versions of this recent translation of the Rubaiyat by the 12th century poet Omar Khayyam, illustrated with these tiny pictorial scenes, which are set amongst a profusion of this beautiful decoration with the gold vine leaves and uh, fruiting vines. The miniature differs from the original painting as it naturally lacks the detail and the elaborate architectural features we've seen. Additionally, in this miniature, you can see there's a dark wood on the right, whereas in our picture, we have um, courtyards and architectural Italian features. 
This version of the Rubaiyat was given by Morris to Burne Jones, who made a gift of it to Frances Graham, the daughter of his patron, William Graham. The Rubaiyat was first published anonymously in 1859 and attracted little attention, uh, but then was found out to be translated by Edward Fitzgerald and then started to find an uh, enthusiastic admirers in Rossetti, Swinburne, and it was Swinburne who gave Burne Jones a copy in 1861. Then Burne Jones recommended it to Ruskin, who was so taken with the work, he declared, I never did till this day read anything so glorious to my mind as this poem. The poem remained one of Burne Jones's favourites, saying, I think Omar Khayyam is an immortal work and Fitzgerald shall live by it. All but one of Burne Jones's illustrations for the poem depict a male and female figure in romantic settings. This is the third of those illustrations and it reproduces a composition of love among the ruins being a suitable subject for the mood of the poem. The picture was used to illustrate the verse contemplating the preciousness of the present moment in the light of past regrets and future fears. So in conclusion, although the picture is set within an environment that gives the impression, and the impression of abandonment and decline, and Burne Jones's couple seem to be conscious that their love is threatened by the same sense of decay already suffered by their surroundings. I think there's the implication that love is a more enduring and a greater power. As we've seen, that small clump of harebells, bottom right, believed to be harebells, um, it's a small and delicate blue flower, but it's said to symbolise true love. And this, together with the tender embrace of the lovers, illustrates, I think, that love can survive and indeed blossom amongst the ruins. Well, thank you very much for, for listening. And I'll just turn my video back on so that that people color. can see me. <laughs> and that was a little run through of one of our pictures in our collection. So please do um, feel free to um, ask if there's any comments or any questions that I can help with. Yes, that, well, thank you so much, Helen. And I think so fitting as we just passed Valentine's Day over the weekend. Oh, yes, um, I should have said actually, that was no, my okay. reason. That was, a, yeah, that was my reason for picking this <laughs> one. We have so many lovely objects and I've been trying to think uh, of this new series um, that we're doing every month for one object. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to pick anniversaries or events or something appropriate. And this uh, seemed to be appropriate, yes, just two days ago, Valentine's <laughs> Day. And, and I think in my mind, it's, it's the most romantic object we have in our collection and uh, oh, yeah, one of our favourites. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I, I, so enjoyable. Um, I should say, if anyone joined us a little bit late or had difficulty with, with the sound, you will be able to rewatch this session later in the week. We're going to be uploading it for free onto YouTube. Um, and do just be in touch. Um, over email at societymanager at williammorrissociety.org if you have any trouble accessing it. But yes, if you have any questions, um, please do feel free to type into the chat and I can read it out to, to Helen or if you'd rather speak one-on-one, -on -one, um, again, do just let me know in the chat and I can, I can call upon you. So I'm just opening the chat now. And I'm getting lots of fantastic um, comments, Helen, brilliant talk, very interesting talk. <laughs> oh, that's kind. Thank you very much. Thanks. I do have one question here. Um, and we're wondering if this piece in real life, do we know how big it is, the scale? Gosh, you know, I'm not sure if I can tell you that straight away. Yeah, I mean, the one that we have, the print that we I mean, have. Our, on... print, our print is 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 um so is is smallish yeah i'd say um, it's probably the size of a, a computer screen yeah i'd say yeah. i'd say it was but the actual original i don't unfortunately have the um original measurements to size although i did see um i mean the the, the watercolor is in a private collection but I, yeah. i've got the um i have got the measurements but not unfortunately actually with me at this moment no worries. I can get them i can get them in, in, after the, the talk straight away. Um, 
think we have got an answer to the oil. Oh, do we? Do we? Does someone? Oh, yes, here we are. Oil on canvas. Let's see. Um, 37 and a half by 63 inches. Thank you very much, Hannah. Yeah, thank you. That's great. <laughs> oil on canvas. Wonderful. Um, let's see. Do we happen to know? I know you mentioned the watercolor is in a private collection um, or privately owned. Do we know who owns it? No, no, I'm, I'm afraid I don't. I've not been able to, to find that out. Somebody here watching may possibly mm. know, but um, yes, I mean, it, it did cross my mind if it was in a if it was in a famous person's collection like Weber. I, I'm sure we yeah, would know because yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he wouldn't mind. I think us knowing that. So I imagine it's. It's gone to a, a collector who doesn't want to be um, his collection doesn't want to be known about. Darn. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, and thank you so much, Hannah. Um, for those interested in the measurements or the details of the oil on canvas, Hannah's very uh, uh, helpfully put the link to the National Trust website where we can see that. Oh, um, brilliant! Thank, thank you. you. That's really helpful. Oh, and interestingly. Um, Someone else is telling us that um, the image was actually used as a Christmas card by Andrew Lloyd Webber. I oh, right. I'm, I imagine that that would be the, the oil version because he went to, he visited Whittick Manor yeah, yeah. and absolutely loved it. Um, it's great to see you um, with us, Helen. Helen's the collections manager, curator at, at Whittick. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know her well. So it's great to have <laughs> you with us this morning. And oh, you're saying it's oh, no, his watercolor. Oh, oh, it is his watercolor, is it? Very interesting. Right. Oh, right. Oh, that's interesting to know. But I know, I know he'd love the collections at Whitty as well. Oh, yeah. The, um, I think I believe it made him cry. He was okay. so taken with the uh, the collection at Whitty. Oh, thank you, Helen at Whitty. That's fantastic. That's very interesting. Um, do we know? Oh, yeah. It uh, <laughs> it did make him cry. <laughs> yes. Oh, goodness. Um, do we know, Helen, um, the, the Rubaiyat, is it, do you know if it's available um, at all online? Oh, it is, the whole, the whole of the poem. The whole thing, fantastic. Is, is, is available online, um, yeah. Um, so, pe so people can see it, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm just, I haven't got the website to hand, but it is. No worries, I think, um, I think actually our own um, volunteer and trustee, Angela Carl Clark, is telling us that it is available on the Metropolitan Museum. Does that sound right to you? Um, yeah, it could well be. I, I, imagine, I think it was available on, on the US. Yeah, that, that that makes sense. Sense. <laughs> Thanks, Angela. <laughs> um, do we know how the society came to own this piece or to have it as part of the collection? Unfortunately, we don't know the, the provenance of this one. Um, it's a little bit hazy because the majority of the society's collection came via uh, Mrs. Marion Helena Stevenson, who was um, a collector of Morris items and a friend of May Morris. Yeah. And she actually lived at Kelm Scott House um, from, for many years. Um, and when she died in the 70s, um, 1970s, she actually left Kelm Scott House and her Morris Art Collection to the Society. So it was almost like a ready-made museum she <laughs> handed over to us. Uh, but there was no very little paperwork to go with that, uh, which is understandable. So unfortunately, we don't quite know um, how she acquired these um, items. We think that some of the Morris and Company items possibly were collected by her, bought by her, mm. when Morris and Company went into voluntary liquidation in 1940. Um, um, so this possibly could have been one. As I've said, it's in the original Morrison Company frame, so it could have been directly from Morrison Company. Yes. When I think items may have been sold off, um, you know, uh, when when the sale came along. Thank you. And we do have a raised hand, Jim Mitchell. Do you have a question? That's a Oh, no worries. Um, it's a phantom raised hand. Don't worry, it happens all the time. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I'm just making sure I'm going through to see if we've answered all of our questions, which I think we have. Um, oh, one more. Let's see. Well, okay, well, this can be our final question. Um, 
uh, Fia Mehta says, thank you so much for your talk. And she just wanted to say that one of the ruins looks like a gear, while in the background, the passage frame looks like a fireplace frame. I wonder whether they're symbols that stand for something. Do we know anything about the, the symbolism? I, I mean, I've, I've read about the symbolism of the flowers and yeah, the, uh, yeah. the briar roses, the harebells, the, the cherubs connoting like youth and yeah. sort of nature triumphing over sort of man-made items, mm -hmm. um, sort of nature triumphing. Um, I haven't come across anything particularly about it, but yes, I, you are right. They do mm -hmm. look like, like cogs mm -hmm. and, or gears, that sort of thing. So it could perhaps be um, when it's, when it's sort of like a civilized city that sort of made in, make, make, making mechanical um, um, things like that. But unfortunately, because we've only got fragments, yes. I don't quite know. It could just be, it could be a suggestion um, of just nature triumphing over yes. you know, man-made um, or mechanical things. Um, but I think it's guesswork because yes. unfortunately um, I've read what um, critics have said, but I haven't actually got anything. I don't think anything has been actually found to be by Burn Jones himself mm. very much about, about the symbolism. We're just reading into what what, what we think it could be. But okay. no, it's a good point about that. There's so much to read into this. Picture. Yes, yes. There's so much to unpick. It's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Yes, lots of lots to be done. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, again, for joining us. Helen, I don't know if you want to reflect at all on any upcoming sessions we might have. Oh, yes, I should um, say that, um, well, as, you, as people um, can see on our website, um, it's actually tomorrow we've got some family weaving workshops. Um, if anybody's got little ones around, so to take part in those. Yes, all um, you need is some wool and a fork. It's fork weaving. Yes, it's very it's exciting. exciting. It sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, then February the 25th, um, our next full um, formal lecture um, is about the art exhibition Wallpaper Man. So that's one of uh, the very first of three events uh, about that um, art installation, uh, which looks really interesting. And then our next informal talk about an object from the collection, um, one of our curator talks, again, our third one in the series, will be on um, the third Tuesday again of the month. So that will be Tuesday, the 16th of March, again at 11 o'clock uh, for 11's time. <laughs> and on that day will be, um, well, I thought it'd be nice to to celebrate the fact that it's not only William Morris's birthday in March, but it's also his daughter May's birthday in March. And they both came up with the design uh, for honeysuckle, but two different designs, a wallpaper and a textile. So I thought it might be quite nice to uh, look at two by the two Morris, two Morris honeysuckles and have a look at that, looking at the, um, the textile printing and the wallpaper printing, block printing. So uh, that'll be our next curator talk. Oh, fantastic. Well, we look forward to that. Um, and yes, we hope you're able to join us. Again, booking is the same. If you can't make it live for that event, as with this and our first session, they will be on our YouTube channel. Well, thank you so much to Helen for that tremendous um, uh, look into, the, into this fascinating object in our collection. And thank you to everyone for joining us. Wishing yes, thanks you so much. Thank you. Lovely to see everybody. See you. Hopefully see you next month. Take care, everyone.